The 2008 financial crisis hit every industry hard. With major corporations unwilling to shell out grand sums of money for sponsorships, many NASCAR teams that had become staples of the sport found themselves out of business. Dale Earnhardt Incorporated suffered after the departure of Dale Jr. to Hendrick Motorsports and went through two mergers, first with Ginn Racing, then with Chip Ganassi Racing, eventually leading to the demise of Dale Earnhardt's greatest vision. Three formerly championship-level race teams, Everham Motorsports, Robert Yates Racing, and Petty Enterprises, merged to become Richard Petty Motorsports. Solid mid-pack outfits like Bill Davis Racing, Morgan McClure Motorsports, MB2 Motorsports, and PPI Motorsports all found themselves out of business for good, when just a decade prior they were competing for race wins on a semi-regular basis. These teams going under allowed for the birth of several new race teams, all on shoestring budgets trying to get a foothold in the Cup Series when the economy would eventually turn back around. Teams like TRG Motorsports and IMSA Sportscar Team, Joe Nemechek's Nemco Motorsports, and Phil Parsons Racing all entered their hat into the ring with little success at the top level of NASCAR. Even further down, you had journeyman drivers start their own teams because they couldn't find a ride. Jeremy Mayfield, Carl Long, Norm Benning, Larry Gunselman, Derek Cope, and Kirk Shelmerdine all tried and failed to grow their teams into something greater. But what if I told you that one team who sprung up during this time did in fact make it? It was by no means an easy or quick journey, but they eventually won a Daytona 500 and just this past season won a race on pure pace, something that seemed insane just a decade ago. Today I will be chronicling the rise of Bob Jenkins Front Row Motorsports from making weekly appearances on the DNQ list to winning Cup Series races on merit. When Front Row Motorsports first showed up in 2005, it definitely seemed like a piecemeal kind of effort. The cars would always show up in a blue and black paint scheme with no sponsor, with no fixed number or manufacturer. They'd show up with numbers like 34, 61, 64, 92. Sometimes it would be a Chevy, other times it would be a Dodge. Just like the number or the manufacturer, the drivers who attempted races for them reads like a who's who of random NASCAR drivers from the late 90s and early 2000s. Randy LaJoy, Jeff Fuller, PJ Jones, Chad Chaffin, Kevin LePage, Hermie Sadler, Stan Barrett, Tony Raines, amongst others. Even a legend like Bill Elliott attempted the 2007 Daytona 500 for Front Row Motorsports. This randomness didn't exactly serve the team well. From 2005 through the end of 2008, the team had yet to start more than half the races in any given season. The name Front Row Motorsports was incredibly ironic at this point. However, for 2009, many of the teams that I mentioned at the start of this video went out of business, leaving more spots on the grid for front row to make races. It also helped that Gone were the black and blue paint schemes, replaced with Taco Bell, a and w and Long John Silvers. You see, Bob Jenkins owns around 150 franchises of these chains, and giving his cars logos of fast food joints people actually know did a lot for the perception of his race team. Sure, the team still did not have a real sponsor yet, and Jenkins was funding those races out of his own pocket, but you can't deny that having Taco Bell on the car, for example, helped attract attention to the 34 car. What also helped was having solid drivers in the car consistently. 2009 saw two veterans in John Andretti and Tony Raines pilot the two cars. This, along with Andretti bringing some sponsorship along, helped the team out. In 2010, the team ran three cars, with the third car being ran for rookie Kevin Conway, famously bringing sponsorship from Extends. While it was a big joke to everyone, the Extends money helped Front Row grow, pun very much intended, until the checks started bouncing and Conway was out the door for good. It also helped that in 2010, Front Row began buying used equipment from Roush, which was still a consistent force at that time. With the top 35 rules now in place and two veteran drivers in David Gillen and Travis Quaffle, Front Row quickly became a mainstay in the cup field. The first four years were really tough, but by the start of 2012, it seemed things were on the up and up. David Reagan had just lost his ride at Roush after losing sponsorship and found a new home for 2012 in the 34 car for Front Row, a solid pair of hands that could deliver consistent results for a team still trying to establish itself. Reagan no longer had to deal with the pressure of a top team and could settle in his new ride. Being a small team, they knew that their best chance to win races would be at restrictor plate tracks, and hiring a strong plate racer like Reagan paid off in the spring of 2013. Although the results don't really reflect it beyond this race, I'd be willing to bet that David Reagan was a big benefit to the team. His original stint at front row was from 2012 to the first race of 2015, after which he spent the rest of the year subbing at Joe Gibbs Racing and Michael Waltrip Racing. However, this opened the door for a future star to make his debut for FRM. 
After running several races in the 34 car after Reagan left to replace Kyle Busch, Chris Buescher wrapped up the 2015 Xfinity Series title for Roush Fenway. Being a Roush driver, there wasn't a cup seat available there just yet for 2016. Instead, Roush placed him in the 34 car at front row and expanded the technical alliance between the two teams. Although Roush Fenway was on a steep decline by this point, this new partnership laid the foundations for front row's best season to that point. In the second Pocono race that season, Chris Buescher and the 34 team did a longer stint, trying to gain positions through an overcut, hoping for a yellow. And oh boy did they get one. Just as the pit window was opening for them, a huge cloud of fog descended upon Pocono Raceway and decided to park itself over the track for several hours, forcing NASCAR to call the race just 22 laps from the end, handing Busher his first career cup win and giving FRM their second. Winning Talladega in 2013 was awesome, but by 2016, winning had a whole new meaning. The introduction of the playoff format came with a win and you're in element. Front Row Motorsports would make that year's chase, provided that Busher and company could break into the top 30 in points by the end of race 26. Despite struggling for most of the season, Busher put in a heroic performance just two races later at Bristol, finishing fifth on pace alone and securing his spot in the 2016 playoffs. Although they were a quick elimination in the round of 16, 2016 proved that the team was capable of pulling in big results on merit and they didn't always need weather or a plate track to give them a good finish. By 2018, Reagan returned to the team and Busher's successor Landon Castle was brushed aside in favor of Michael McDowell. By now, the 34 team had solid sponsorship from Love's Travel Stops and the results were improving. Michael McDowell's journey deserves a separate video, but he is a driver who is basically made for a team like Front Row. Great road racer, good plate racer, can bring home a car in one piece. By this point, with the charter system in place, Front Row is basically locked in as a team unless Bob Jenkins decides to sell for an extremely high price. They no longer have to worry as much for survival as they did in the early years, they can focus on getting results. I don't know how, but post-pandemic Front Row Motorsports is a completely different team than the one that existed before. And in no instance is this highlighted more than in the 2021 Daytona 500. Sure, it took plate racing being the great equalizer and two teammates taking each other out on the last lap, but by God, Front Row Motorsports was now a Daytona 500 winning race team. For the rest of 2021, McDowell posted the best average finish of his career, and it would only be better moving into the new era of NASCAR. The next-gen car was meant to equalize the gap between the best teams and the lowest. 2022 saw McDowell post an average finish of 16.7 and score 12 top 10s, by far the most ever for a front-row driver in a single season. Unfortunately, the 34 team missed the playoffs due to a 100-point penalty after failing inspection at Pocono. 2023 wasn't quite as good, but it still delivered Front Row's best overall performance as McDowell dominated at the Indy Road Course and took a commanding victory, the first time that FRM had ever led the most laps in a cup race. McDowell and newcomer Todd Gilland, son of longtime Front Row driver David Gilland, continued to take the team forward, which honestly I don't think a lot of people saw coming. It's been an impressive rise from a minor fly-by-night operation to a legitimate race-winning outfit, and I don't think it'll ever be replicated again. As long as the charter system sticks around, there won't be another Front Row Motorsports ever again. The amount of money you have to spend to buy a charter means that you'll have enough capital to run well from the get-go. Trackhouse is funded by Justin Marks, who allegedly is worth billions, and a popular artist like Pitbull. 2311 is backed by Michael Jordan, Denny Hamlin, Toyota, McDonald's, etc. Future rumored cup teams include Junior Motorsports and Andretti Autosport. These aren't scrawny little teams punching above their weight like Front Row had to do. For Front Row to join the sport at a time when serious race teams were falling by the wayside and stick around this long and become what they are is a testament to Bob Jenkins' perseverance and the hard work and effort of everyone who has ever worked there. It's truly the last true underdog story in NASCAR.